So good evening uh, from Wolfville and Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Welcome to 2021 and to our third virtual event of the year, heading into February 14th, Valentine's Day, as well as Pink Triangle Day. We thought it might be a nice idea to have um, a couple of experts here with us this evening to talk to us a little bit about wine. My name is Una Proudfoot and I'm the Executive Director of Alumni Affairs in the Office of Advancement at Acadia. I'm delighted to be here, of course, uh, with all of our virtual event series that we've been running for close to a year now. We're coming up onto a year, uh, and particularly this evening with uh, a colleague from campus uh, and a community member from town. And we'll get into introducing them in just a moment. So as I've already indicated, um, we'll ask everyone to keep yourselves muted during the bulk of the presentation. Uh, it just helps with the background noise, which is uh, ironically a little amusing for me right now because my puppy decided to act up just as I started holding a ball. Here's some background noise, that, that is. Uh, also, the video that you have, I think everybody has their video disabled right now, and we appreciate that. Uh, for yeah, but I'm watching the wine thing. Um, for recording purposes, purposes but also yeah. um, so that recording purposes and also so that um, we don't get distracted with other folks on the screen. Um, I did just mute somebody quickly there. So if you find yourself muted and you didn't mute yourself, that's what happened. Um, we have a chat function in the Teams uh, platform for those of you who may not be familiar with the platform. Uh, and at the top of your screen, you'll see a little uh, dialogue box. It kind of looks like the cartoons that we read when we were kids. Um, and if you click on that, you're able to write uh, on the right hand side. So if you're interested in asking a question during the presentation, either Matt or Gina's will ask you to write it there. Um, at the end of the presentations, when there's a little more time, uh, you certainly can unmute yourselves and ask your question directly if that's your preference. We've entered all of your names into a draw and we'll announce the winner at the end of the session uh, when we wrap up at seven o'clock. We are cognizant of your time and thank you for joining us this evening. So we'll try to keep it, keep it to seven o'clock on the nose. Uh, I think that's it for housekeeping items, so I am going to get into introducing our speakers here this evening. So please welcome me in, or join me rather, in welcoming Gina Haverstock and Matt McSweeney. Gina Haverstock, Nova Scotia born, Port Hawkesbury, Cape Breton, uh, started her winemaking career at Gasparo Vineyards in 2006. A Bachelor of Science graduate majoring in biochemistry with plans to become a doctor, Gina took a job at Yost Vineyards in the summer of two, 2000 and was soon captivated by wines. And I appreciate that part of your bio, Gina, because I remember interviewing you years ago and you telling me that story. With this newfound love for wine, Gina sought opportunities to expand her knowledge. She completed her sommelier certification in 2001 and shortly afterwards began the Bachelor of Science program in viticulture and enology. Did I get it, Gina? <laughs> At Brock University in the Niagara region with the goal of becoming a winemaker. After her studies at Brock, Gina worked at wineries in Germany, Austria, France, and New Zealand to increase her knowledge base of cool climate winemaking, certainly appropriate as she was heading back to Nova Scotia. She was happy to return to Nova Scotia in 2006 uh, as Gaspro Vineyards winemaker. Her wines, particularly her Riesling and aromatic and aromatic whites have received international awards and accolades. Gina takes great care to transfer the essence of Nova Scotia's extraordinary terroir, terroir into truly outstanding wines. As of 2018, Gina's role in the company has expanded from solely making the wine at Gaspero Vineyards, where I originally met her, to overseeing the winemaking team at Yost, Gaspero and Mercator Vineyards as head winemaker at Devonian Coast Wineries. Wow. Gina currently resides in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, with her two children and her husband, Sean. And Sean and Gina also co-own the Annapolis Cider Company, a boutique cidery in downtown Wolfville. And if you've never been, absolutely need to drop in there. And joined this evening from our campus and also the town of Wolfville, a close neighbor of mine, Dr. Matt McSweeney, joined the Acadia University faculty in 2013 after completing both his BS, P, BSc and PhD in food science at the University of Guelph. He studies primarily sensory science. Dr. McSweeney's research focuses on the sensory aspects of food, so taste, aroma, appearance, and texture, and is largely concerned with the factors that influence the acceptability of food products. Recently conducted studies by Dr. McSweeney have examined the use of new sensory methods, 3D printing, 
uh, wine produced in Nova Scotia and the production of new food products from alternative grains and food waste. Can you 3D print wine is my first question. Dr. McSweeney, or otherwise known and more affectionately known in the town as Matt, joins Gina today to share with all of you uh, in Nova Scotia and beyond their findings, their productions, and probably most importantly, their wine, their love of Nova Scotia wine. So thank you both for being here. Uh, we chatted briefly before folks joined the call to see, you know, if we we're going to be sort of very kind of specific and scheduled about our presentations this evening. But Matt and Gina are both pretty down to earth people and, and just love what they do. So I'm going to hand it over uh, to Gina first and then she's going to chat a bit and then hand it to Matt and we're going to kind of field questions from there. So over to you, Gina. Thank you, Una, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, I, I, this is my first time uh, doing a virtual tasting, actually. So, uh, so thank you, Acadia alumni, for for asking me. It's funny. I, I know a lot of wineries have been doing them uh, as part of their their thing, especially since COVID. But uh, yeah, like I said, you're the first. So, so thank you. Um, and uh, one other thing, um, I'm joining you, uh, as I'm sure a lot of you are joining uh, me and us, uh, from my home bedroom and home office, because we had a lot of snow. I don't know if everyone knows this, uh, I know people are probably joining from Nova Scotia, but other parts, we had probably 40 to 60, somewhere in there, centimeters of snow dump on us last night. Uh, so so um, the, the winery's a little blocked in. So here I go. Uh, so again, thank you, Una, for the, the lovely introduction. Apologies for such a long introduction. Um, I, uh, I, I'm really happy to be here. So as Una said, I'm, I'm the winemaker at Gasper Vineyards, and I also um, help head up the winemaking at Yost and Mercator Vineyards. Those are two wineries, obviously, right here in Nova Scotia. Um, so Gasparo Vineyards is, uh, is the winery I'm going to be talking most about tonight, and they're the three wines that we're going to be tasting tonight. Um, Gasparo Vineyards is just three kilometers over the hill from Wolfville, from basically Acadia University, um, on the corner of White Rock, Walk, White Rock Road and Greenfield Road. So just over in the Gasparo Valley. It was the first winery to be established actually in the Gasparo Valley. And, uh, you know, we've got uh, about seven acres, uh, sorry, seven different varieties on about 30 acres um, planted. Um, plus we have uh, an additional um, acreage about um, eight acres uh, in adjacent in an adjacent vineyard. So uh, consider still a boutique winery. And uh, as, as Una said, we specialize in um, aromatic whites and, and, uh, and, sort of food friendly and sort of moderately robust reds. So that's kind of kind of um, our, our stick there. Um, in all in Nova Scotia, just to give you sort of a broader sense of, of the Nova Scotia wine industry, we have um, just under a thousand acres planted in the province. There's a, just under 20 uh, different wineries in the province of various sizes. Some of them are, are, are smaller than Gaspro, you know, sort of micro uh, wineries, if you will, and some are on the commercial scale. So um, there, there's a wide range of wineries in Nova Scotia. Um, we also uh, have people that grow grapes that don't make wine. So we have contracted uh, growers. So that helps to, um, to, to give us grapes from all over the province. Um, uh, and it, uh, it helps to employ a lot of people. Um, if, if any of you have been back to Nova Scotia um, in the last, say, five years, uh, you'll have a sense that there is a feeling of a, a wine hub in Wolfville and, and, you know, Acadia is obviously a part of that. Uh, we've got several, I don't know, 10 wineries probably within a, a 10 kilometer radius from Wolfville. So it is, it does feel, uh, really, um, exciting if I may, from the inside looking out, um, uh, very exciting to, to be in the industry. Um, um. I think I think that's all I wanted to say as an introduction. Um, we'll get into specifics about the wines and about um, and any questions, obviously. But Matt, do you want to take it over from here? Sounds good. Yeah, I can take over from here. So um, just briefly, I'm Matt McSweeney. Thank you so much for the introduction, Gina and Una. Um, and I just wanted today to talk about how we conduct tastings of wine at the university. And as Una said, I am a sensory scientist. So um, we conduct them a little bit differently than we will today. But what I really like to do is figure out why people like food. That's my whole thing. So I think I have one of the best jobs in the world because I just get to feed people food I actually pay them to eat or drink the food or beverage 
And then I get to figure out why they like it or dislike it today. And because of that, uh, in the last, yeah, wow, how many years? Eight years out of KTN now? Um, I have been working a lot on the Nova Scotia wines because they're really exciting. They're they're new. People are interested in them. And it's just been a great time for me. So I'm briefly just going to go through um, basically what would happen if you came to a sensory tasting at Acadia University in the Center for the Sensory Research of Food on Wine. So we called this project, How Do Everyday Consumers Discuss Nova Scotia Wine? And really, this was aimed at people who really like wine, who don't know that much about wine. So um, you're interested in it, but you might not have the education that Gina does and you're sommelier, but you like drinking wine and you want to find out more about it. I wanted to find out how you describe wine. So we ran this project for three years and we actually had over a thousand consumers drink uh, Nova Scotia wines. They actually evaluated 87 wines. I can't remember what proportion of Nova Scotia wines that is at the NSLC right now. It's a, a fair amount of them, I think though. Um, and we mixed it up with red, white, rosé, sparkling, and Tidal Bay wines. And really we had a lot of fun. It's a really fun job when you give someone a $15 gift card to come drink eight glasses of wine. Um, and you get to breathalyze them after, which is also kind of fun to be honest with you. Um, so it was a great project. Um, we had a ton of students gain experience in the sensory testing world. We learned a lot about Nova Scotia wine. And uh, just a quick thank you to the Nova Scotia Department of Agriculture because they paid for this project. So it was a lot of fun. And but basically what would happen if you showed up to one of these tastings is you'd be given eight glasses of wine. As you can see, only about 30 milliliters of wine, so not a full glass, but you'd be given eight glasses of wine. You'd be given a couple unsalted crackers, which are, if you ever work in a sensory lab, you've eaten sleeves of these for lunch because you've forgotten your lunch. And you also usually are given a glass of water. And basically we'd ask you just to drink the wine and report what you taste in the wine and how you feel about the wine. And in this project, we use something called projective mapping. And projective mapping looks a little like this. So it, it looks a little intimidating, but it's not intimidating. What it means is all these little teardrops are over here. And then you would take a sip of the wine and you would drag the teardrop over and you would decide how similar or different the wines are. So if you thought sample 105 was similar to sample 310, you'd put them very close together on the map. If you thought 520 was really different, you'd put it way far away from 310 and 105, also in sample 215. Also, as you can see down this bottom right corner, we have all these attributes for you. Also, you can add your own attributes. So every time you drop down a teardrop, this little box pops up here and you would select what you taste in the wine. Um, for those of you big in the wine, we started off just using the Aroma Wine Wheel by Ann Noble and we expanded it every trial we ran. So like I said, we ran, we, we had a thousand people come through. That was about 15 sessions of testing. So every every session of sensory testing, this box got bigger and bigger. But we did split it up being red, red wine, white wine, et cetera. So after we completed all this, I'm just going to show an example of what we got. We had So this is an example of the red wine blends in Nova Scotia. And we had 74 participants come to this session. And they actually used 90 different terms to describe the wine. And I don't want you to read all this, and I'm not going to go into the stats right now because, as I've learned, stats in wine don't mix very well, especially when you're drinking the wine. <laughs> so, um, but basically, we did a bunch of stats, and from these 90 terms, we broke down the wine into the, the terms they used the most to describe the red wine blends. And they used sweet and fruity, oaky and vanilla, and dry, peppery, and balsamic. And as you can see, these are on opposite sides of the map, indicating these are different wines associated with these terms. And we did this for all the white wines, all the sparkling wines, and all the tidal bays in Nova Scotia. And we kind of figured out what Nova Scotia consumers, how they talk about wine. They use very broad terms. Um, we'd like for them to use a little bit more specific terms, and it's great you're here, and I'm, I'm sure Gene is going to show you how to taste the wine. Also, as you can see here, none of these deal with the appearance or the mouthfeel or the texture of the wine. And that is also very important to wine. So one of our big takeaways was we need people to actually look at the wine, which sounds foolish, but they're skipping that. And we need them to actually assess how the wine feels in their mouth. And I'm sure Gina's gonna talk about today. Sorry for not Gina, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, awesome. So we did this a lot and we found a lot of really cool information. Um, 
we I could go real deep on this. I'm not going to, but we've scared we've shared it with the Nova Scotia Department of Agriculture, and we're hoping they share it with the wineries and then with the consumers, etc. But it was a lot of fun. It's probably the um, wow. It's probably one of the highlights of my time in Acadia so far. And I just want to say a quick thank you to a lot of the research associates who worked on this in the lab. You can see when you're working on wine, it's a lot of smiles. And I also just want to give a quick shout out uh, to Tiffany Manson, who's here today. And I didn't include her picture in this slide because she worked a lot on these trials and I apologize, Tiffany. So sorry about that. Uh, apologies, <laughs> but it's OK. We'll, we'll put another picture up for you sometime. But yeah, it was. a because I think you guys want to taste the wine now, not just get wine. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matt. I'm just I'm going to pop in just with a couple of comments, if I may. Um, I saw that uh, uh, Susie Curry commented in the chat chat function already that she can attest to how much fun it is to go and to do these tastings. Um, me also, I think I I uh, have participated in as probably as many as I could squeeze in, uh, because you're absolutely right. When you're being asked to contribute to research, because first and foremost, that's why we do it, obviously. Uh, but then you're asked to eat or drink, and then you're you know thanked in a monetary way for doing that. I'm kind of sitting there going. I love my job on campus. So, um, but I haven't been there uh, since you started the the projective mapping. So that's kind of cool because I remember sometimes when you're when you're sitting there and you're grappling with all of those adjectives that you were showing us. You're right. Like sometimes I come from it's red and white. Those were the two adjectives that I started with, right? So you know, sort of launching further into my wine drinking career and learning a little bit more about using those adjectives has been really uh, really interesting and i also will just make one more quick comment about um you know the the sensory piece of it and it's not just how it tastes and i remember years ago i went to a wine tasting and, and we were taught to look at it first and and it was suggested that if you liked the look of it then smell it and if you liked the smell of it then taste it but if you didn't like the look of it or you didn't like the smell of it, the chances of you liking that next step, step in the sensory were, were less. And since then, I've, I've really noticed that. Like, it's really quite inc incredible when you check an aroma, if you kind of go, oh, ooh, I'm not sure about that one. You kind of feel that way when you taste it, too. So it's, it's really neat. So already lots of information for us to, uh, to digest. And uh, we'll, we'll swing back to Eugene. I think that put you on the spot a couple of times there during that, uh, that piece of information. Luckily, um, that's exactly how it was going to play out. So there was no, there's no, uh, no issue at all. Um, Matt, I just wanted to add, um, I did some sensory uh, research when I was in my uh, undergrad for at wine school, let's call it, and um, and I was doing a retro nasal uh, uh, evaluation. So I was actually doing your job where I had the the three coated glasses and pushing them in front of people. I couldn't use real wine at the time, unfortunately. I had to use um, flavors added to water like you know uh so your your research sounds way more exciting i have to say um and you know what uh, i love research but really this is my research you know as a winemaker tasting the product um is is kind of where things uh start. so um i did tell una that i wanted to have a, a sense of people that are familiar with nova scotia wine so if there's a way um, let me see. How, what's the best question to ask, Una, to to get the the right <laughs> the right number? Can you raise your hand if you've ever if you if you've ever had Nova Scotia wine before on your little? Um, so so there is a, a hand a raise hand function. Matt has already found his and has raised his hand. Lots of people finding it right now, Gina. Um, I see it actually. So that's great. Good. Okay. Good. Wonderful. Um, I'll ask another question then. How many people have never had Nova Scotia wine before? I would say a handful. Okay, okay, good. I, I, I've got a broad range. So for those that have had it before, I will go um, over some th things that you've probably heard, and for those that haven't, I, I hope I uh, I hope I make it clear. And uh, I think Una said there's lots of opportunity for questions, so you can chat it in, and then um, and uh, Una, you can feel free to interrupt me if it if if need be, or we can wait till the end. However it goes. Uh, what I would encourage is I'm going to go through um, the tasting of these three wines. We've got the 2019 Gasparo Riesling, the 2019 uh, Gasparo Tidal Bay. 
and the 2016 Lucy Pullman. Um, that's what I'm going to be tasting. So after every wine, we'll leave a little um, maybe time for questions or comments if you want, and then, then maybe address them at that point. Um, first and foremost, though, I wanted to go through a quick and dirty is what I was going to say. I'm not sure that's the right word, but a quick and easy um, uh, a little uh, evaluation of wine. So first things first, um, you notice that Matt had these glasses. I think you can see, I'm going to try to see what you see. Yeah, um, had these glasses in, uh, um, in his tasting evaluation. These are called ISO glasses. They're very standard. You've probably seen them at, uh, at all or most of the wineries in Nova Scotia. Um, and just a couple things about a wine tasting. I'm going to use my Riesling as just a quick little um, example of how to do a tasting. So I'm going to pour a little bit of Riesling in the glass. I don't so know if this is an invitation to join you, Gina, but I'm joining you. Absolutely. Please do. I'm going to go through uh, um, how I would evaluate a wine. So yeah, if you could or any of those three wines, I'd start it with the first one because it will be a, an easy segue into the, <laughs> into the first tasting. Um, but um, first things first, when you have the ability to hold a, a, a wine glass by a stem, some of them don't have stems, but it's handy to hold them by the stem. And there's a couple of good reasons to. One, ideally your wine is served at the correct temperature. If you end up holding the wine like this in your hand, What's going to happen to the wine? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm used to doing this in a group where I can hear people answer. I will answer the question for you. Um, it can warm up the wine. And so you're not getting the wine at the ideal temperature. Uh, second thing is, um, if you are like me and like to cook, um, I love to chop up garlic and onions and all those things. And I wash my hands, of course, before and after cooking, but I can I can smell that garlic for several days after. If you have your hand close to where you're going to, you're going to smell the wine or evaluate the nose of the wine, I'm going to smell garlic, and that's not a, really a good a good um, aromatic descriptor of a wine. Um, and it's not fair to the wine because that's not coming from the wine glass. So that's another reason why it's nice to hold it by the stem, keep your hand away from where you're smelling. And third. Um, if you're eating something um, greasy, um, saucy, whatever, and you're grabbing the wine like this, and then you're trying to look at the color of the wine, as Una said, she learned that it's an important part of the evaluation of the wine, you're, you're not going to be able to see through the wine glass. So if you have a stem, those are the three reasons why you would hold the, the wine like this. So um, I invite everyone right now, um, if, I hope everyone has a little bit of white wine in their glass, to without moving the glass a whole lot. Um, actually, I'm gonna step back. Uh, first of all, um, when you're doing a, a wine tasting, there are three steps, or three parts to the evaluation. Evaluating the, the look of the wine, um, evaluating the aromatics or the nose of the wine, and then evaluating the, the taste of the wine, which includes the flavor um, and, and the mouthfeel. So those are the, the three steps. Um, when you're evaluating the, the uh, look or the appearance of the wine, it's really handy to have uh, natural light. Of course, we don't have that right now in Nova Scotia. It's dark outside, but a bright room with natural light is ideal. And having a white background is also ideal. Um, I don't have a white, white background right at the moment, but normally I do. Um, uh, basically, you can just take a, a piece of loose leaf or something like that and put it behind. Um, why that's important is if you have a piece, something that has color in the background of your wine and you're evaluating the color of the wine, you're gonna see that color through and it's going to change your impression on the, of the color of the wine. Um, so if you have, uh, like I do, a white wine and I have kind of a, a desk color, a wood color, it looks a lot darker. So nice to have a, a white appearance. But first things first, pick up the wine by the stem, I tip my glass at about a 45 degree angle and look through the center of the wine um, with a white background. Uh, like I said, I don't have one at the moment, but uh, um, if you look at the rim of the wine, um, the color of the, of the rim of the wine, um, if you had a very aged white wine, for example, it would have a different color from a very young wine. So if you've had an, uh, a wine, let's say, I'm just throwing out some numbers here, from that's 10 years old and um, and you have a the same wine that is one year old, the color is going to be different. You're going to get deeper, more golden colors. So just by looking at the wine, you can already have a sense 
um, have a hint of what this wine might be. The other um, interesting thing is if, if you like oak aged wines or not, um, an oak aged wine tends to be a little more golden in color. Um, these are just generalizations, of course, but they tend to be a little more golden in color than one maybe aged in stainless steel if they're the same age. Um, and already you're getting hints of what this wine might be before you even bring it to your nose. So uh, that's one of the important things um, about looking at the appearance of the wine. Um, my boss, uh, Una, just based on what you said, my boss always used to say, there's too much good wine in the world to uh, waste your time on a wine that has faults. So if it's cloudy and it looks scary and it's not what you anticipated, or if there's stuff floating in it, or if the nose doesn't smell great, there's so many great wines in the world. Don't waste your time on those. <laughs> that's what he used to say. So so after we uh, evaluate the color of this, let's let's actually go through um, with this first wine, the 2019 Riesling. Um, I get kind of a straw color, um, maybe a little hint of silver, and a very light and, and translucent color on the wine. Um, Una, I thought you were going to say something. Sorry. Okay. No, nope, my dog um, to bark, so I went on mute. Oh, okay. Um, so that's what I, I get. It's quite um, clear, reflective, and bright and brilliant. So, um, uh, you know, uh, well, well, uh, well made wine, <clears throat> if I may, if I do say so myself. So the second thing I want you to do is take that wine glass by the stem and without moving it a whole lot. And if you've had wine before, you tend to move it. I, I tend to move um, even a water glass um, um, all the time. Try not to move it a whole lot and put your nose in the glass. Take a nice big sniff of the wine. So I feel like I failed already, Gina, because I don't have a stemmed glass. It's okay. It's okay. I I had to buy my parents ste a non-stemmed glasses because uh, my dad was always worried about him hitting, hitting them over. So. Well, and I just chose one that had Acadia on it, so it doesn't have a stem. So I'll take a few docked points, but there we go. All good. I think as long as you're drinking wine, and especially Nova Scotia wine, I'm happy with whatever vessel you put it in. Um, so everyone just smell the wine without moving it too much. Now I'm not going to comment on what I smell right yet, um, the aroma, the aromas I get, but now I want everyone to take the wine by the stem. I'm going to see how I, what you can see of me. Okay. I'm just trying to evaluate this, put it down to the desk that I'm on. Okay. So if everyone can see, I have the glass right on my desk. I'm going to ask you to swirl the glass. And sometimes you can do this in the air if you've had practice, but I like to swirl it around, if you can see, on the table. You probably can hear that. Um, and now smell the wine and tell me if you notice a difference. Oh, see, again, I'm asking questions. I'll tell you in a moment. So right now I get a lot more coming out of that wine glass. I hope everyone else finds that um, to be the same. Um, and that is why we swirl a wine glass. We're trying to coax all those aromatics that are in the um, in the wine to come out and and hit our our, our nostrils basically and go back through um, into uh, well retronasally. But that, never mind. <laughs> that's a, that's a different thing. So we want to we want to get as much of those aromatics coaxed into that wine as possible. And that's why again we we uh, swirl a wine when we're doing a wine tasting. Um, some people, um, I'm sure that there may be questions about uh, legs of a wine. Um, I'm just looking at the appearance of the wine. Um, legs or the are the teardrop bits of wine that kind of um, slide down your glass once you swirl it. So if you swirl it around and then you watch how the wine slides down this, the, the inside of the glass, yeah, you can you can see those legs. Now sometimes people think that legs mean uh, a wine is if there's um, legs in a wine, it means it's a great wine. What the legs indicate to you is the relationship between alcohol, sugar, um, um, viscosity, and, and other things in the wine. It, it doesn't tell you if it's a good wine or a bad wine. I can have a wine that um, has a fault in it that has beautiful, these beautiful legs rolling down the sides of the wine, and then you smell it and it's faulted. So it doesn't indicate quality, but it does indicate um, uh uh, yeah, how these these um, these three or four things that I said actually interact. So, for example, if you have a really high alcohol wine, generally speaking, you get more teardrops and coming more frequently. Um, if you have a, a sweet wine, say like an ice wine or a dessert wine, they often run slower and they're more viscous. So that indicates that there's more viscosity in the wine. 
but all of these these things interact. So it's hard to say, you know, um, that a high alcohol wine is just going to give you a plentiful legs and they're gonna they're gonna run down the side quickly, or a sweet wine's going to, you know, be slow and have fewer legs. Yeah, just a little sidebar there. So quick question on that one, just because we're talking about legs and 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 the question, is it a question or am I asking you if it's a myth? Is that why glasses are polished? Does that aid or detract in the legs of the wine or is that a myth? Uh, it would definitely um, it would definitely help the legs to actually flow down the sides. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, polishing the wine glass is more probably an appearance thing. Um, but uh, just on a sidebar, if you are having a sparkling wine, if you ever look in a sparkling wine glass, they often have a little etch at the bottom of the glass. You probably don't see it inside, but that actually helps the uh, the bubbles, the beating of the bubbles to come up so nicely as everyone wants to see that. So you don't want to have a, a an unpolished glass because it looks bad, but it probably would catch the legs and it would, it would hamper the way that they should run, if that helps. I, I, it's a good question though, Una. I don't know if I answered that quite well, but um, okay, that was a sidebar. So now we're going to talk about the aroma of the wine and I'm just going to give this a swirl and put my nose right in the glass as I do and just um, tell you what I smell. So right away, I'm getting really nice fresh apple. I'm getting um, a lot of uh, minerality. So um, minerality, when I say that, I often mean like wet rocks. Um, I always think about um, just before a rain or just after a rain when you're in a rocky area, you know, that, that aromatic uh, note that you get. Um, that's kind of what I, I think about when I, when I say minerality. I smell Sorry about that. Uh, a lemon, and if you heard that nose, um, noise. Um, I also get a nice lemon, um, lemon lime kind of note as well. And, um, and a little bit, a very hint of, of, um, of petrol. Now, petrol is often used to describe excuse me, describe um, an aromatic that you get from an aged Riesling. So it's a tricky one to kind of put your finger on, but the best way, and it's a terrible way to describe it, the best way I've come out to describe it is maybe it has a little bit of kind of like, like Vaseline. If you smell a Vaseline, it has a little bit of petroleum, a petrol note. And that's actually a really positive um, uh, note when you're, when you're aging reason. That's kind of a natural progression in, in the um, aromatics. I don't get it a whole lot, but I get maybe a little hint of it. But mostly um, minerality and, you know, apple, apple Ford for sure. Um, and maybe a little um, lanolin, so like a, a little waxy note, um, which is, is positive. It helps to kind of round out those, those primary uh, fruit characteristics. So that's what I smell in the Riesling. Now, finally, the best part of a tasting is to actually taste the wine. But I'm gonna show you first, if you don't mind, um, I'm gonna show you how I do it. And hopefully you can pick up the noise I make um, when I'm tasting this wine. So first of all, as I said, I'm, I evaluated the, the appearance of the wine. We evaluated the nose of the wine, last the taste. So I'm gonna take a little bit of wine in my mouth. I'm going to um, swish it around for lack of a better uh, word. Um, um, create some turbulence to try to coax more aromatics out of the wine and up through um, the back of my throat to my nose so I can actually retronasally taste it or, or uh, aromatically evaluate it, I guess is more, more accurate. Um, I'll go into that in a second. But, um, and I'm going to suck air over the wine and make a slurping noise. And again, we're trying to coax all those aromatics out of the wine so we're, we can sort of identify all those really unique um, aromatics. So um, at the same time, we're gonna be coating the wine around our mouth to get it to all our different taste buds. And, um, and, and then we're gonna talk about the wine. So I'll, I'll do it first if you want. Wow, great. So great acidity, great aromatics. Um, so I, I, I'd like everyone else to do that if you could. So take a little sip of wine, swish it around, maybe not as vigorously as most mouthwash, but get it around to all those different taste receptors in your mouth and suck some air over it if you over, 
over it if you can without dribbling. It's tricky. And then, then, um, and then evaluate all those different aromatics. You've got nice acidity coming in there. You've got those, those apple. I get a lot of apple um, and mineral notes, uh, lemon lime again coming through. Um, and then I'm getting a little hint of sweetness. I, I hope everyone can, can um, taste that as well. Just a little sweetness. And for, for the Gaspro Riesling, the whole purpose is to balance the sweetness with acidity. So you don't want to have something that's too sweet. You don't want to have something that's too acidic, too sour. So you balance that out. Um, and um, having a nice balance between acidity and sweetness, to me, makes the ideal food wine. So in this case, I love oh, so many things with this. But I love pork. Um, uh, many appetizers, salads, soups, um, lots of seafood goes really well with the minerality and the, and the bright acidity that, that is shown in this Riesling. So if that, if that's a. So on that one, one of the questions that I had listed and, and we do have a couple of questions showing up, um, right. you know, when I was quite young and was taught to properly set the table for my parents, dinner parties and, and what have you, I was also taught you know, white with chicken and seafood and red with your red meats. And is that a thing of the past um, or, or is that sort of a general, a general rule still? It's, it's a general rule, but um, it depends how the food is cooked. Absolutely. So um, I like to give the example and which say fish you're talking about or which poultry you're talking about. So um, you can imagine a, you know, a very plain sort of steamed piece of chicken breast um, um, compared to a roasted chicken with garlic and sort of that the caramelized notes of, of onion and all those things. Those, those are very different white meats and very different, and they, they would um, pair well with two different wines, in my opinion. I'd say the first where it was, um, you know, very, um, I don't know, plain, if you will. You, you want to have a, a very simple wine with maybe some bright acidity. Um, with the roasted um, chicken, uh, with all those caramelized flavors, I think you could go for something a, a little bit bigger, maybe with some oak, say like an oak chardonnay or, or um, something like that. So yes, <laughs> with the whites, for example, but it, it all depends. And, and with reds and, you know, some um, red meats, I mean, uh, you know, um, I'm trying to, I guess I'm trying to think of an exception. So yes, you're right with, you know, red meats, red wine, but there's always exceptions to the rule. Uh, tuna is the one that jumps out at me. I love a raw, a rare tuna steak with Pinot Noir. Now that's seafood and people think, oh, it's seafood. I'm going to have it with a, with a white wine. Um, definitely go red with that one. So you, I think you, it was quite obvious to me in how you began to answer that in that first example of the chicken and, and just boiled chicken. Now I know why my mother just kept it very simple. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's funny. Sorry, that was, I'm trying to think of some examples that maybe drive home the point. But, but generally, yes, but it, there's always exceptions. Yeah. Okay. A any questions about that? Um, um, I, I can talk about a little bit about the, um, you know, the residual sugar or anything like that. I'm not sure if we want to get into that. So I, I, no, carry on. I'm keeping an eye on the questions. We do have a couple. Okay. Um, I love that we have a comment from somebody who joined us in Alberta and she says it's still afternoon. So no, no wine for her, but she's taking in, taking in the information. Um, and so we do have a couple of questions, but not specific to the wines yet, Gina. So okay, I would encourage you to carry on, uh, Wonderful. But, but maybe toss it over to see, just to offer Matt the opportunity if he has any responses or reactions to, to what you've said so far. Um, my only response was really that uh, talking about food pairings like that, a sensory for a long time was evaluating just the wine. Now the new technique is to actually ask people what they would pair with the food and then ask them how that makes them feel. And we're learning about how people like to pair it with food and their emotions evolve. And that's really helping us understand what drives liking and dislikings of food. So kind of the same but different. But it's, it's for me, as a guy who's used to like one scale, it's kind of cool to like ask them what they want to eat with the wine. <laughs> Nice. Absolutely. And I, you know what I say too? I mean, there are general rules and, but my, my favorite, um, my favorite comment is, you know, if you're drinking Nova Scotia wine and you're enjoying it, keep on doing it. But if you, if you are interested in, in, in learning a little more or trying something, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to, you know, give some, some suggestions or some, some generalizations, but, uh, but keep on, keep on doing it. Keep on supporting. 
Sure. Okay, so that was the Riesling. Um, again, the 2019 Riesling. So um, with the finish of the wine, you know, there, there is definitely some bright acidity, so it helps to cleanse the palate and helps to, to kind of refresh your mouth, possibly for the next bite of food that you're going to have, but not too piercingly, um, you know, sour or acidic. These are words I don't usually use in a wine tasting, but um, bright acidity, so that it it's, um, yeah, it, it's balanced. It has some sweetness and um, and has a nice kind of refreshing finish is how I, I like to say um, that that ends. So um, just watching the time here, I see where it's quickly ticking away. So I'm gonna move on to the next wine. And that one is the Tidal Bay. So I'm gonna just quickly look to see what you can see. Sorry, I'm gonna adjust here. There we are. So this is the 2019 um, Gaspro Tidal Bay. Um, Tidal Bay is made by uh, many wineries in Nova Scotia and Tidal Bay is an Appalachian wine. It's wine that represents Nova Scotia, um, I guess, uh, a, a style and a, a wine, a wine that's made in Nova Scotia. Um, Tidal Bay, is a, um, a stylistic wine, but it has to be made from 100% Nova Scotia grapes. The style of the wine is very, uh, is kind of a low alcohol, uh, aromatic, um, bright, refreshing uh, white wine that's a blend. So it's a blend of different grape varieties. Um, and simply put, it's basically a taste of Nova Scotia in a glass. Um, it's meant to reflect what we, the terroir or the growing area that we have in Nova Scotia rather than any one variety. So um, different wine wineries and different winemakers uh, make Tidal Bay. They use different grape varieties to make the blend, but they all have to have a common theme. And that common theme is that they represent Nova Scotia terroir. So mineral driven is another, is another component of that. Um, I'm trying to think um, if anyone knows the, the wine region, um, uh, Bordeaux. There are different wineries or um, uh, chateaus that make Bordeaux. Um, some people blend 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. Some people blend some Merlot, some Cab Franc, some Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, they are all considered Bordeaux, though. Um, but but they're but yeah but they are made from different grape varieties. Um, but yeah, the, the key is that it tastes like Bordeaux. In this case, the key is that it tastes like Tidal Bay. And not just anyone can whip together a Tidal Bay, put a label on it, and say, okay, I want to make a Tidal Bay. It's a it's a, a wine that has standards. So there are certain rules you have to follow when you're follow when you're uh, growing the grapes for Tidal Bay, when you're um, making the wine in the winery, and uh, of course there are a list of acceptable or um, um, uh, varieties that you're allowed to use and ones that you're not. Um, it's a three tier system, so I'm not gonna go um, get right into the details, but the first tier of grape varieties is the most plentiful um, grape varieties that are allowed in the blend. And they include varieties that are classic to Nova Scotia, uh, Lacadie, Blanc, Vidal, Saval, and a variety called Geisenheim, um, uh, <laughs> Geisenheim 318. Um, so we call it GM 318, uh, just for short. So those um, varieties are often the, the basis of the blend. The tertiary varieties, there's a, or secondary varieties, there's a, a, quite a large list, but they all include, of course, 100% Nova Scotian grapes. And the third um, third group of grape varieties are the really aromatic grape varieties. Um, those are grape varieties that can overpower a blend if they're used in a high performance. Uh, percentage. So they are capped at 15% or less. So uh, for an example, in New York Muscat, you can't use it more than New York, uh, more than 15% of New York Muscat in a Tidal Bay blend. So even if you get all those things right, you follow all the rules in the vineyard, in the winery, you've got your grape varieties right, you can't just um, stick a label on, uh, on a wine and call it Tidal Bay. You have to have it actually sent in to um, our um, ITP independent tasting panel, our Tidal Bay tasting panel, to to assess your wine to see if it's typical um, of Tidal Bay. If there's no faults, if it's typical, then you pass and you can put your wine in a bottle. So um, what I'm trying to say is that we, we have strong standards here in Nova Scotia um, of, of what Tidal Bay is, and we really want um, want people to get a great sense of, of uh, Tidal Bay and of the Nova Scotia wine in general when they open a Tidal Bay, no matter what winery it's from. So I'm gonna open that, that wine. 
By the way, all these wines we're tasting tonight, um, Una made up of it, are under um, uh, cap or Stelvin cap. Um, and some people have some, some um, sometimes have a little bit of a, a hard time getting into Stelvins. So my, my trick, I'm going to see if you can see what I'm doing, is put your hands at opposite sides of the bottle, obviously at, at the top and then at the bottom. So you get more of a lever arm and just twist. And then it's done. Some people um, try to open it when their hands are up here and it's really, it can be hard. The best chance of getting those open nice and, and, and swiftly um, is, is by putting your hand at the top and the bottom of the bottle. Okay, so we're gonna taste the 2019 Tuttle Bay from Casper Vineyards. Um, I'll, ta I'll talk about the blend a little bit after. But generally speaking, um, I would say Gaspero, the style of Gaspero Tidal Bay right from the get-go has been one that we really like it aromatic forward, um, bright acidity, um, a lot of tropical fruit, generally speaking. Um, and, uh, and we do that by actually, not by, but um, we don't use Lacadie in our Tidal Bay. So if anyone knows about Tidal Bay and knows about Nova Scotia grapes, often people say, oh, Tidal Bay, it has to have Lacadie in it. We're one of the only wineries that has never put Lacadie um, in our the major varieties are Saval and Vidal in our, in our title. Day. They change slightly year to year, but those are the major varieties. Okay, let's try uh, tasting the wine from start to finish. So if you were to look at the, um, look through this wine, um, see what you can see here. Sorry, everyone, trying to get you. There we go. Um, take a look at the wine. Um, I also feel that this one is nice, bright, and reflective, and, and quite um, almost steely and, and very light straw, so very translucent. Um, okay, so that's the appearance. I'm gonna now smell the wine. So give it a nice swirl, stick your nose right in the glass. Mm. I get notes of pear right off the bat, some floral notes and, and some tropical notes. I'm having a hard time right at the moment putting my, my, my finger on what I'm getting. I often get some, some uh, mango, on here, but I'm I'm getting um getting something else. A nice um a little bit of a spicy note actually, probably a little hint of the muscat coming through on the spicy note. Anyway, that's what I'm getting on there. So so a, a little bit of apple too, of course. Some some fresh sort of Gravenstein apple just to throw in the beautiful grape uh, the apple varieties that we have here in the valley. Okay, now the taste. So um, compared to the uh, the Riesling, which is probably the best place to to um, to start, we've got some nice bright acidity. Maybe not as much acidity in the Tidal Bay as I saw in the Riesling, and I would argue that this one maybe has a little more roundness on the palate. It feels more a little more like um, like oil and less like water uh, on the palate. If you you know that's the richness or this viscosity that you may feel. Um, but still a great um, uh, finish, a refreshing, um, crisp finish. Um, and and I, I guess that's basically one of the reasons why Tidal Bay goes really well with seafood and shellfish. And there's an old, uh, there's an old expression that what grows together goes together in the food world. And I, I really love that um, idea where, you know, Nova Scotia is almost an island. We're a peninsula. We have a, huge, a vast um uh, range of coastline and we have all these gra grapes that grow close to the coastline close to water and and then we have these beautiful you know shellfish and and uh, all the different uh, seafood out there and and tidal bay just i know it grows close to it it goes with it um on the table of course i love that that's great okay that's that's the tidal bay and i'm just checking time here oh we're we're Getting down there, I better move on to the red, unless there's just some questions, Una. Well, I'm, I'm looking through some of the questions that were submitted prior to, and one of them was, which wine is your favorite wine? So I'd like oh. to hear from both of you on that one. That'll let you go first. My, my favorite wine, that's really difficult. As I put in the chat, Lucy Kuhlman was the first Nova Scotia wine I ever had when I moved here. So that's kind of kind of soft spot in my heart since then. So I'll go with that one right now. Yeah, we drink a lot of that. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that or not. So. <laughs> in moderation, you just mean regularly. Yes, regularly, yes. 
<laughs> and you know what? I'm, I'm, I I'm want to hear your answer as well, Gina, you know, uh, but I'm going to chime in and, and join Matt on his response. I, that's that's where I'm going to. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, it's tricky. Um, I'm going to answer um, with a very diplomatic answer. And it's like when someone asks you what your favorite, who your which which child is your favorite? It's really tricky um, uh, to choose a, uh, a favorite wine. But I do. I'll answer in, in several ways. I really love the art of blending. You know, um, to make the Tidal Bay, we have a certain style of Tidal Bay at Casparo. And every year you get different grapes coming in, you get different situations, you get, you know, like our 2018 frost, you have all these things thrown at you and you're trying to make a certain style of wine. So the blending, you know, obviously the fermenting is is great and exciting time during that during the, the harvest. But but the blending, the art of getting that just right is, is what I enjoy. So I love making blends. Um, so things like Tidal Bay, I, I get really excited about. But I also have a soft, soft spot for Riesling. I spent some time, uh, as Una said, in, in uh, Germany. And uh, I, I first worked at a winery there that made 90% Riesling. So I had different Rieslings from different um, areas. And, um, and I just fell in love with Riesling. And when I came back to the province and I got the job at Gasparo Vineyards, we had Riesling planted. And I got to make my, my first Riesling in Nova Scotia right when I came back. And so I, I really enjoy uh, Riesling as well. So moving right along to a red, so we have something different to look at this time. Um, first of all, uh, you'll note that it's a 2016 uh, a Lucy Kuhlman. Lucy Kuhlman, by the way, is the name of the grape variety. Um, it is, um, it's a grape variety that was developed in Alsace, France by a gentleman named uh, Eugene Kuhlman. Um, and there's a couple of stories thrown around as to how he got the name, uh, he decided to name the grape variety Lucy Kuhlman. I have no idea which one is right, but I always, uh, on tour at Gasparo, I've heard various um, iterations of this. One is that Lucy Kuhlman is, was his daughter. She was a fiery redhead and he needed to name this grape variety something special and, and he want, named it after his daughter, Lucy. Uh, the other uh, is, uh, is about a mistress, that, that this was his mistress and he named, uh, named the, the wine after his mistress. I don't know. I just think it's a great little grape variety. And however it was named, um, I love working with it. So um, in terms of style, our Lucy Kuhlman is 100% oak aged. Um, if you've ever been to Gasper Vineyards, we have several um, stacks of oak barrels um, in, in our little um, viewing cellar and aging cellar. Um, and we, we have both French and Hungarian um, oak barrels there of various ages. Um, and basically the the what we're trying to do with Lucy Coleman is to help to um, uh, add some tannin, some of that drying sensation to this, this red wine. Lucy Coleman generally has low to moderate tannins at best as a grape variety. So we're trying to add some tannin. We're trying to add some, uh, some, some um, concentration by putting in barrel because you actually evaporate some of the wine away as it ages in barrel. And so it concentrates what's left. Um, and uh, we're also trying to get some, some uh, interesting flavors, some vanilla and some coffee notes that you can get from, from barrel aging. So that's why. But the key is in in in, my, in our sort of um, um, idea of making red wine is to not overpower them with oak. It's just to make them subtle and elegant um, to sort of help to um, enhance them rather than to overpower. So that's kind of the deal. I see we're five minutes. We better get into this. Okay. So uh, a quick look at the rim of a red wine. Um, I'm, I'm getting actually still some nice magenta. It's 2016, so it's, it's got several um, years on it, uh, which means that it's nice, soft, and approachable right at this moment. So um, I hope you all uh, all enjoy this. Um, and if you do, uh, it's available at, at, on the NSLC shelves. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a great one to get. If you want something a little older and a little uh, mellower, um, you, can, you can get this uh, as a current. Um, so I still get a, you know, like a bright rim on the edge. If this was an old, um, showing a lots of age, you might get some orangey or more brick-like colors on the on the rim of the of a red wine that would in, in, um, indicate that it's probably um, starting to age a little bit uh, and getting older. Um, let's go right into the nose. Oh, I love this wine. I had a friend that used to call wines that he loved to smell duct tape wine. And I said, what? You think it smells like duct tape? You know, he said, no, I want to duct tape the wine glass on my head so I can smell it. 
all the time. I was like, ah, okay, good. I get that. Um, so I'm getting some really like um, black cherry hints of, of raspberry in there. Uh, of course, some nice oak, some spicy notes um, from the oak as well, uh, some vanilla, and I would say some dark chocolate in there too. But again, the, the fruit comes through, so you're able to get that cherry note uh, right away, but, but also being supported by this nice, soft kind of chocolate vanilla note. Okay, let's go right into the taste. So right away, I'm getting that fruit carrying through. I get that spiciness. I get some nice, a um, little bit of heat from the alcohol, but not too much. I get a little bit of that tannin, um, that drying sensation on my teeth. And that's from the tannin. And tannin in, in general, I'll just throw this right in here, helps um, help, uh, tannins in red wine help uh, red wine go really well with, with meat. So the the proteins and the, and the, and the fat in meat um, can attach to these tannins, and that's why you often see red wine with meat. Just a quick sidebar there. You know, with this one, Gina, I, I'm almost satisfied just smelling it. You know, it's it just for me. It you the the way you described it, and I'm not near as articulate in describing it, but for me, the smell is just it engulfs me. It's almost worth it, or almost almost enough. <laughs> Is it a duct tape wine for you, Una? Yeah, it is a duct tape wine for me. <laughs> Perfect. So, and then there's a, you know, a nice uh, smooth finish again, because there's some age in this wine. It just, um, you know, there, there's a nice, a, a, a mellow backbone of acidity to help um, pair with um, this wine with a lot of different foods. You need a nice uh, balance of acidity, as I said, to, to be a good food wine, in my opinion. So, um, but, but it's soft as well and, and round and finishes out quite nicely, if I, if, if I do say so myself. <laughs> Absolutely lovely. Uh, and, and as I say, I'm, it's my go-to. It's one of my go-tos. Uh, and I mean, generally speaking, in the worlds of wine, but absolutely in Nova Scotia wines, for sure. Um, a question that came up in the chat function that also came up um, pre-submitted uh, was your thoughts, and I'll, I'll ask Matt to weigh in on this yeah. first from a campus perspective, is, is what, are, what are your thoughts on developing a wine school at Acadia? Is it Matt first? Matt first, yep. I can go first here. I'm obviously a little biased, but uh, I think it'd be pretty great. I think we could partner with NSCC, but I know they already do a great job, and together we would have some great resources um, that could lead some really fun stuff. I, I think so, but once again, person who works on wine at Acadia, so pretty biased response there. So, yeah. I think mine's going to be biased too. Um, we put down our roots in Wolfville, and I think um, Acadia is a is a great pillar in Wolfville, and uh, and it makes us, you know, is is part of the reason why um, this town is so wonderful. So so having something that um, hones in the wine industry a little more is great. I, I should add though, we have um we have a great uh, uh, tool or. Uh, uh, that the winemakers use called a lab it's it's the uh, it's an wine al analysis lab so winemakers from across the province probably even um, outside of the province send their wines in to get analyzed at acadia so um more and more we've been we've been definitely using um, um haley and the gang at a lab to, uh, to help them um, analyze our wines which is great you know you're busy during harvest and you want to know you know crazy things about your wine um, uh, or, or juice, um, Haley, uh, Haley really and her team really do a great job. So there's already something started. So if, if it could continue, that would be lovely. Well, I, I will tell you, and it's no secret because it was asked in the chat function, it did happen to be the Dean of Science who asked the question. So, you know, <laughs> I, I don't want to suggest that that might be there, mean there's some support there. I also see that the Dean of Science has her hand up. So over to you, uh, Susie. Thanks, Una. Sorry, I'm just so excited about these possibilities. And thank you so much to you and the Alumni Association for putting on this delightful presentation. And thanks to Matt and Gina. It's just been marvelous. I love it. And I, yes, I'm obviously playing my hand here. And <laughs> I'm super excited about the possibilities. And I think hearing from Gina and hearing from Matt, and of course, knowing about the wonderful a service that the A Labs providing, thinking about our location, thinking about the thousand acres and the almost 20 wineries, 
thinking about our relationship with NSCC, which is growing. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just, you know, this is something I think that we really want to pursue. And I'm interested also to hear from alum um, to think about, you know, and Gina, too, your experience at Brock, um, with the program at Brock, you know, could we, you know, knowing what you know about that program, knowing about what we have here in Nova Scotia, knowing what's at NSCC and what's at Acadia, is this something we could do? Like, truly, really? <laughs> There's a lot I'm of synergy, excited. that's for sure, that's for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I, I think, you know, I always see the wine industry as such a, a promising industry and we, you know, we're, we're just coming out of our shell and, and still growing. So I think um, for me, I mean, sky's the limits for us. Let's, let's, let's get her done. <laughs> And, and I, I think that's a probably a, a fantastic, not probably, that is a fantastic uh, note to end on because I'm cognizant of the time. But like so many of our events and our topics, clearly an hour is not enough. Um, so we could go on for quite some time probably um, tasting the wines for sure, <laughs> uh, but also having this discussion. And, and you know what, I, I count my blessings every day that I ended up where I ended up in this wonderful world of agriculture uh, and, and possibility and research and all those partners that have been mentioned in that last question to you. Uh, so I certainly have high hopes and I'm certainly hopefully not going any anywhere anytime soon. Um, so listen, folks, we quickly run out of time. Um, I would like to extend the invitation to anybody who's on the line. If you have questions that you want to have asked, if you pop them in the chat function, we'll do our best to pull together some of the answers if we do end up with some questions uh, that we didn't get to this evening, uh, because we do email out everybody who was on the call this evening to do an evaluation. Um, so you can pop your questions in there if you like uh, and we also send the recording to folks who registered and didn't make it so they'll see all of the content that was shared this evening uh, and we also post it online so anyone who didn't even hear of it yet but wanted to to check it out can see that so I can send the link to both of you if, you, if you're keen and using it in any way shape or form um, so uh, just a quick announcement of our winner for this evening's swag package that will be sent out. Sadly, it will not be bottles of wine, uh, but we're, we're sending that out to Karen Hope. If you're still on the line this evening, you are the winner of our draw prize. Um, and before I get into the, the official thank you to our speakers, just to let folks know that our next event is on February 22nd uh, at the same time, same bat time, same bat channel as we would say many, many years ago. Yeah. And it's a pen Panel interview with campus and community members uh, on an Acadia specific initiative uh, to support our Black and Indigenous students. Uh, and it will also be a call uh, to ourselves to action to further support these students. So looking forward to that panel. Uh, we've got Sabrina Whitman and Robert French uh, and Junior Mwaku joining us. So we hope to see you on February 22nd. Um, and Gina and Matt, listen, I just thank you for giving your time this evening. Uh, I kind of chuckled to myself if this had been an in-person event, there's no way we would have gone with it with that two feet of snow that we got last night. So therein lies the beauty of having virtual events. Um, and, and thank you for your time and your knowledge and your passion. I think that's the that's the biggest one for me. It's just your interest in in uh, in the wine industry specifically, and, and Matt for your interest in in sensory science. Because uh, I know for me, when I when I uh, eat and drink, it really is a full experience for me. <laughs> so thank you both very much. Thank you to everyone who joined us this evening, who called in, uh, and hopefully we'll see you on future events. And like I say, we'll be in touch by email with uh, follow up information. So enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone, uh, and we'll hopefully talk soon and stay safe. Thank you. Happy Valentine's Day and happy Pink Triangle Day, everyone.